Colossians 3, right at the end. This chapter has been so good for us. Have you guys sensed that? This chapter is good. Paul, the author of a, the letter to the church at Colossae, has been giving the details of what life should look like when the gospel has been present and when Christ has been in control. He's encouraged several ways to put on the new life in Christ and put off the old life in the flesh. We've seen a new mind, a new action, new communities, new relationships, new motivations discussed in this chapter. Paul's laid out the practicalities of the new life in Christ. But there's one big area that really Paul hasn't discussed yet. It's one of the areas that our culture claims is of utmost importance, but also seems to be very confused about what to say about it. Let me illustrate what I mean. How many people would say that the college that they attended in their life, or the education that you pursued, or didn't pursue, was more important and had more lifelong consequences than the spouse that you married or the children that you had? Would anybody say, and if you do, actually it's not a good time to raise your hand, but uh, would anybody say, you know, if I put up on this side my education choices, and I put up on this side my wife, my husband, my children, would anybody say that the biggest, most important decisions of my life were the colleges that I attended, rather than the family that I built? I don't feel like anybody's agreeing with that. I could be wrong, but I don't feel like we will agree with that. Listen to this. We love education. I'm not going to bash education. I love teaching. Education opens up career doors, gives us tools to become a lifelong learner. But my point of this illustration is that we treat education and family far differently when it comes to preparing and training our kids, youth, and 20-somethings. I guarantee you, if you are a family with even marginal financial ability to purchase a home in a particular neighborhood, you do everything you can to move somewhere where the schools are good. There's often, that's often the first thing that we'll look for when we move to a new area. Well, how are the schools? Not good. Okay, well, let's look somewhere else. That's what most people do, and that's good. As soon as I was a middle schooler, 12 years old, already a thin mustache, <laughs> the teacher started talking about college. We know exactly what it takes to get us on the right track. If you want to get to a good college, you need an SAT score of this, you need an ACT score of this, AP classes to get that GPA up, those college credits. You need to start with honors classes earlier in, in the ninth and 10th grade. So middle school, that means you got to get ahead on that point so that you can get into the honors classes by the time you get to ninth grade. Not only that, you need to be a well-rounded person and join clubs and play sports. Societies, parents monitor the grades, they enforce homework on time, everything possible to give kids the best education. Even when kids aren't motivated, parents will step in and often push their kids over the finish line so that they don't waste their life, right? There are serious come to Jesus talks. If you miss this window, not only am I not going to pay for anything else, but You'll never go back. You think you'll go back, but you'll never go back. You have the serious talks. But with discussions of marriage, planning for a family, we say things like, well, that's just something they're going to have to learn on their own. Or there's just some things you have to learn the hard way. Or that's a personal decision that they're going to have to make. But I thought we all said the family was the most important thing we've done in our lives. Culturally, it's a very confusing thing when we spend more time preparing children and youth for their education path or their extremely unlikely sports path. I'll say that one, just, just gonna put that free. I'll talk to you later. Then we do speaking clearly about what to look for in a spouse or the realities of having children and raising a family. But to make matters worse, the very same schools that we push our kids into have their definition of what a family and a marriage is. And they are not shy about teaching that. The scriptures are not silent about the most important relationships that we have, our families. The new life in Christ is not just for salvation in the church. The new life extends to the one place where we are most likely to let our guards down, and that is our homes. Our home life is actually a great concern to God. 
Because you know that? God actually cares what you do at home. He actually cares how you treat your husband, wife, and children. All this church stuff, it's not just for church stuff. It's for home stuff at the same time. His desire is that we would display Him, yes, even in our homes, in our marriages, and in our families. And so today, I have three clear teachings from Scripture on the new life family. Would you pray for me before we look at the Word? Father, we know that what we're about to do is a supernatural endeavor to read your Word, to ask for your guidance. So Father, would you help us to understand what you would have for us today, that your truth would be on display. And Lord, most important, that we would be obedient to that which we hear. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Like I said, we're moving through Colossians together. So if you look at Colossians 3.18, that's where we're going to be. We're going to focus on the new family in Christ. And so uh, just as an a information for you, Ephesians 5 is a great corroborating passage to keep open alongside Colossians 3. There's a lot of similarities. And actually, most people are more familiar with what's said in Ephesians 5 than Colossians 3. But I'm going to stick to Colossians today because that's the book we're in. But no, I am cherry-picking some things from Ephesians 5 because it's basically the same message. So, Colossians 3, 18, and onward reads, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything. For this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. There are really three lessons that I want to show you today, keeping it within the family theme. Three ways that the new life in Christ should inform and affect our family life. Number one, we're going to see the priority of the family. The priority of the family. If you look at the flow of this text, and even to the parts that we didn't read that were just in a few verses after, you'll notice there's an order. Paul talks in an order. God made us to have relationships in this world. But not all relationships are of equal priority in our lives. These priorities must be assigned. There are rankings of relational relevance. You know, some emails have that little exclamation point by. Some of them have two. Some of them have three. Boy, some of us have friends that we talk to. When you see their name come across the phone, ooh, I gotta pick that up. There's other people, when you see the name come across the phone, you just scream that sucker, put it away, right? Because even you know in your life, there are relational rankings that you have of importance. Because if you assign the wrong level of importance to the various relationships in your life, you are going to suffer. So, I'm going to give you four major relationships of your life that these scriptures talk about, and rank them in the amount of importance you place upon them. Today's like the most practical message I've ever done. I just want you to know that. All right, we're just talking. We're just talking friends here. All right. Number one, the creation-creator relationship. This is in order. Number one, the creation-creator relationship. Number two, the husband-wife relationship. Number three, the parent-child relationship. And number four, the employer-employee relationship relationship. Okay? That was our in order. So you need to remember those. I'm going to refer to them now. As I read this text, I wondered, is there anything to the order of Paul's discussion? Because last week we, we concluded with, do everything in the name of Jesus and give thanks to the Father. And then today we pick up with wives and husbands and their parents and children and then servants and masters are following the text. I mean, read it. So I think a lot of friction and pain in our lives come from assigning value to these four areas in the wrong order. I think we're on solid ground saying that your priority should be your creator, your spouse, your children, and your work in that order. Okay? Somebody can name them. Am I on here? Okay. I want to make sure. Okay. So think about this. You will make God to glorify Him and enjoy Him forever. He saved us and gives us purpose and mission and security and eternity with Him. One day, earthly families will be minimized because there will only be God's family in heaven. And so, easily, the most important relationship in your life is that which you have with God. It's number one, not even close, okay? But in this life, should you choose to marry, your spouse is absolutely the next most important relationship that you have. God's desire for you, husbands and wives, 
is to prioritize your relationship and its health. The foundational bedrock of a family and society is the joining of a man and woman in commitment to one another. And from this relationship is grown a family. This is the seed from which a family grows. God's desire and design is that a husband and wife would start a family. Think about the command to leave your father and mother and to cleave to your spouse. In marriage, you are effectively taking your parents out of slot two and sliding them into slot three and taking uh, that who is your fiance at the time and moving her up to slot two in the spouse category. That's what's happening. That's why the moment of the uh, father giving away, I love it. It's traditional, but I love it because it has symbolic meaning. It's showing the symbolic moment when a woman comes out from under the care of her father and is transferred to the care of a husband. God's desire for married couples is that you would prioritize each other over your own separate families. Let each other know and sense that your relationship is more important than the relationship with your own parents. That's important. God's desire for married couples is that you would prioritize each other over your own children. Let's say things like that. This is often not the case even in Christian families. Okay? I'm telling you the truth here. I have heard parents say, we both agree to put our children first. It's just an understanding that we have. Let me talk to you. You don't have that call to make. That's not your decision. You cannot create a contract outside of God's design. Husbands and wives are to prioritize each other over their own children. And that is what God wants. And guess what? The children will benefit more from that. If you began the relationship God's way, then you were married before you had children. Now I know that nowadays that's becoming more rare, but I'm just telling you God's design. This design is not random. This is not because God just loves to prevent sex before marriage, right? That's not primarily what that's about. I mean, he does, but that's not primarily. He is setting the standard that this relationship came first. That's what this is about. You didn't come together because you needed to support the children. Children didn't make this relationship. You came together and loved one another before there were any children there. There was a relationship of love together. And then from that relationship blossomed the beautiful family. The empty nest is often the time that reveals what the foundation of the family was. When the children are removed, husband and wife look at each other and say, yes, this is it now, you know? There's a, there's a moment when it kind of reveals, were you building on the children? Or is this a joyful time that you get to enjoy each other again? And I said, I'll just say this briefly because it's in the text, in that fourth slot of work, make sure that you're married to your spouse and not your job. Work is honorable, work is necessary, and, and I can preach an entire message on how we can glorify God in our work. But don't steal from your family to put food on the table. Mm -hmm. I bet if you ask your kids whether they can have a parent or the newest PlayStation, they're going to take mom and dad every time. And let me also say, if you do have a job that requires long hours, you can still be emotionally present, even in the shorter hours that you're available. You can be present and still love and care for your children. And so if you are unmarried and want to be married, look for a spouse that shares these priorities. God, spouse, children, and work. Don't be afraid to talk about it. Don't be afraid to talk about it. If you're married and your priorities are out of whack and you're looking at that list and saying, that's not true of me, maybe you've overemphasized your kids above each other. Maybe you've overemphasized work above your kids or yourselves. Talk about that together. Maybe you have maybe God's not even on the list. Talk about it today. Just have a fun lunch conversation. Hey, what is our actual ranking? How are we doing? What, what can we do to get back in alignment with the scriptures? This is very to God. It's important to Him. There's a priority in the family. That's our first lesson. Next, I want to show you the second lesson. Number two, the order of the family. The order. Some of y'all thought I was going to escape by this. Y'all don't know me very well. Look again 
It's a passage, uh, verse 18 through 20. Let's just read it again. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives. Do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. There are two words in this passage that are going to help us understand the organizational structure of this passage. Those words are submit regarding the wife and obey regarding the children. We have a structure from these. Now, obviously, that'll fit in the room. There's a lot of controversies over that phrasing, wives submit to your husbands. Okay? Listen to me. This is a general principle. If you are already thinking about ways in your mind that this can't mean what it means, you need to stop right now. Okay? I'll tell you, if you've already gone through and thought how to untwist this from being reality, just stop. You can't approach God's word that way. Go into a clear passage of scripture that says one thing, and then by the time you're done manipulating it, it actually says the opposite of that which it says. If you do that, there's very little from keeping you from holding truth to other pastors in the scripture. That's the kind of person that denies the Bible in a couple years, if you go down that road, okay? So, it says what it says, let's talk about it. Here's some things that I can tell you what it means and what it does not mean. Number one, wives are to submit to their own husbands, not every man on earth, okay? I thought I'd get another female amen for that. All right? This is not about submitting to all men. That's not what this says. It is about one man, the one man you have chosen to be your husband. So don't make it more than it is. You don't have to just listen to any man on the street because he's a man. That's not how this works, okay? Don't make it more than this. Number two, the Greek word for submit is in the middle voice. So all that means is that this is a command to a wife to voluntarily do this. A, a middle voice is like, I brush my own teeth. <coughs> it's something that I choose to voluntarily do to myself, okay? That's the same wording that is used for wives submit to your husband. So this is an act of submission out of the free will and humility of the wife toward her husband. Paul nowhere tells husbands, make your wife submit. You're not going to find it. It's not in there. He never says, husbands, enforce the submission of, no, that's not in there. He says, wives, come under voluntarily the submission of your husband's leadership. This is not the husband's job even to bring about, though he can uh, address it in his leadership. But this is a step of spiritual maturity between the wife and God. This is uh, something the wife chooses to do. And then number three, this is a leadership structure, not a statement of worth or ability. Okay? This has nothing to do with who is smarter, better, or more valuable. I've been an associate pastor before. You know what that means? I submitted to a lead pastor. Was I less of a person? No. It's just helped us to understand our roles to one another. So here's the truth that the world and half of Christian denominations cannot figure out. God has made men and women different from one another. God has assigned different roles to men and women. These roles are to complement one another, primarily in the raising of a family. The role of the general family leadership is to fall to the husband. We still, we still going? Obviously, this doesn't mean that the wife has no voice. Obviously, this does not mean the husband doesn't defer to his wife's desires. Obviously, this does not mean the husband is to abuse his power and become caveman, dictator, or other strong man that you may have heard. Paul's very next words, context, right? Hermeneutics, right? Very next words, husbands, love your wives. That's the Greek agape love, by the way. That's the God love. Not sexual love, not brotherly love. This is a holistic love that cares for the entire person and works for her good. It's a sacrificial love that would lay its life down before seeing the wife come to harm. So the picture here is that husbands are to sacrificially love their wives and care for them and protect them and provide for them and put their needs above their own. All while wives are to voluntarily look to their husbands as leaders in the home and in the family and to defer to them and to respect them. That's what this means. Husbands, 
If you want to destroy your family, neglect your wife and make her wonder if she is loved by you. Stop holding her hand. Stop doing all the things you used to do. Withhold your love and you will watch your family crumble because love is what feeds the soul of your wife. And that's why Paul says it. Conversely, wives, if you want to destroy your family, constantly challenge your husband's authority and let him regularly know he does not control you. When he speaks, pick him apart, bring up his flaws, go behind his back and do things that you've agreed not to do. Every time he makes a suggestion, suggest the opposite. Fail to give respect and watch your relationship crumble. Respect is what feeds the soul of the husband. And that's why Paul mentions it. Now, built into this command for the husband to lead is also an expectation of greater accountability. Husbands, God is going to hold you accountable for whether you sanctified and discipled your wife and children. You are actually more accountable than is your wife for that now, that doesn't mean the wife is not accountable. But with the mantle of leadership comes the mantle of responsibility and accountability. This is why, I'm going to prove it, in the Garden of Eden, when both Adam and Eve had eaten the forbidden fruit, and both were hiding from God in their fig leaf clothes, Genesis 3, 8 says, The man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? Mm -hmm. Eve ate the fruit first, but God wanted to know, where were you, Adam? Man, this is what God will say to us. If you are already married and this is the first time you've ever heard this, look, that God has charged the husband with leadership of the home, there's going to be a learning curve in getting this right. You are going to have to work and pray for God's help to reorder your family. But this is, hear me, this is the path toward joy in your home. This is how to get there. Now, I really want to talk to our young people. Really want to talk to those who are uh, unmarried or just uh, plan to be married. Young ladies, unmarried ladies, I'm just going to talk to you. You have two options with this. You can say, number one, Paul and God don't know what they're talking about with regards to a husband leading the family and go on your merry way. You can do that. You can say that. I, I don't believe that. Nope, don't agree. Nope, not for me. Thanks. I'm going to do something else. Okay, you can do that. Or you can assume that this is God's best for you in your future family. If you believe God made men for leadership and that you will have to submit to a husband, here's what nobody will tell you but what you need to hear. Y'all ready? This is worth the price of admission. <laughs> Marry a husband that you want to submit to. Amen. There it is. I said it. Last time I checked, when Mr. Wright gets down on one knee, when Mr. Wright gets down on one knee and presents the ring, he says, what's, what does he say? I can't. Will you Will you marry me? There's a choice. You have a moment. Now, you can answer whatever you want. And if the idea of submission to this man so repulses you that every time the preacher gets to Colossians or Ephesians, you dry heave in fear or get in disgust or begin to twist the Bible to make it say something else, just say no. Just say no. Ladies, marry a man that makes you say, he's the one that I want leading me and my future family. Amen. I trust him with my spiritual growth. I trust him with the discipline and discipleship of my children. And I would be happy to submit to this man. I see it all the time. It boggles my mind. I'm just going to tell you, it boggles my mind. I've seen it so many times, it hurts me. I see young Christian ladies with all the promise in the world brought up by a loving Christian family, a product of investment of love and care from a father and from a church, settling for losers and goofballs that think Leviticus is a dinosaur. <laughs> the Acts of the Apostles is what Peter and John used to chop down a cherry tree. Ladies, listen, when a man speaks about spiritual things in Bible study, listen to his answers. Listen when he prays out loud. 
See if he prays out loud. Watch how he treats his mother, other ladies in our church. Watch if he misses church and what excuses he gives for it. Listen for little statements like, I don't know if I want children, or maybe I'll think about marriage one day. Let his involvement in church be your interview for whether you give him the job Amen. of discipling your future family. Amen. Take back control of your life. Make submission great again. No. No. <laughs> if you can't say with a smile on your face, I trust you to lead me, he's not the one. Amen. If you can't, he's not. If submit is a bad word, find the man that makes it a good word because God's word is clear. Now men, especially young men with marriage on the horizon, one day there's going to be a family looking to you for guidance and leadership. There are going to be decisions to land in your lap that you have to manage and make with real consequences. There's going to be a little boy or a little girl that God has entrusted to you their very salvation. There's going to be a wife that needs your love, your presence, your dependability, your steadfast faithfulness, and your protection, and your provision. And that is a mountain of a weighty responsibility. Mm -hmm. The world looks at that mountain, and you know what they're saying now? Don't even climb that mountain. It's not even worth it anymore. Just enjoy your life free of responsibility. Go have fun. Don't get caught up in those man-made prisons. But you know what God says? He looks at you and he says, I made you to climb that mountain. You glorify me every time that you man up and accept responsibility. Man, we were given strength not just to roam the earth and satisfy our pleasures. We were given strength to put the weight of others upon our shoulders and to be husbands and fathers and leaders. We were called to love our wives and deal kindly with our children, not discouraging them. We are to use our strength to be a blessing to a family. Amen. When husbands love and lead, when wives submit and respect, when children obey, you will experience the best possible version of your family. Amen. And you will please God. Amen. We've seen the priority of the family, the order of the family. And lastly, number three, the objective of the family. What's this all about? The objective of the family. Why go to all this trouble? Why build an organism called a family that's difficult to keep together and taxing on us and requires responsibility and submitting to one another? Why go through all this? Why, why not just live like animals? Why not have multiple partners and multiple children and multiple combinations of parents when and where you want? I mean, you don't see animals building families and remaining faithful to one another and raising children together. So what is all of this for? What is this? Well, I have four brief answers to that. Here are four reasons for families. Number one, a family reveals God's character. Our God is a teaching God. And his goal is to reveal himself to us. One of the most powerful metaphors we have for God was when Jesus came to the earth calling him Father. This was not common before Jesus' day. And so it helped us to understand a love that God has for us by comparing it to a relationship with a healthy father and a healthy home. It's very possible that God even created the family so that one day we could understand him by calling him Father. Number two, a family effectively passes along the faith. A family passes along the faith. God's desire is that his kingdom would grow on the earth and that people would come to know and worship him. The first way to accomplish this is to teach the ways of God to our own children. The fact of the matter is, nobody's going to care about your child as much as you. Doesn't matter how much you pay. Nobody is going to care about your child as much as you do. So, if parents want their children to know God and to pass along their faith generation, we must teach our own children. A school won't do it. A church can't do it. God made families to pass along truth from generation to generation. All here, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Man, Amen. go check out Deuteronomy 6 sometime. Number three, a family is one of God's protections for women and children. 
The family is actually a protection for women and children. I know this sounds so archaic in our day. But in a promiscuous, violent society where everyone does what they want with minimal repercussions and where marriage is minimized, women and children are most often left holding the bag and dealing with the consequences. Amen. So God, however, calls men to commit themselves to a family. This gives security to a wife, a stable environment for children to grow. Statistically, it is obvious. There's no there's not even debate anymore that fatherlessness disproportionately hurts society and creates a trail of other issues in its wake. God understands the importance of a committed father and the stability of a family. And number four, reason for family. The big one. A family shares the gospel. We know from Ephesians 5 that a husband's love for his wife was designed by God to be a picture for us to understand Christ's love for his church. In the same way that Christ sacrificed and gave his life for the church, so husbands are to sacrificially love and care for their wives. Amen. And in the same way that wives are to submit to the leadership of their husbands, we church are to submit to the leadership of Christ. God gave us families, yes, because families are the best for us, but he also wanted to teach us about his own love for us in families. This is why marriage and family is a serious matter, because when our families suffer, we are ultimately telling a lie about the gospel. If our marriages are supposed to help an onlooking world to see what Christ's love for his church looks like, then we need to present the clearest possible picture and make sure that we are not telling a lie about our God or the gospel. There is new life in Christ. And it matters to him how we live. Yes, in the church. Yes, dealing with one another. Yes, on the stage. But God cares about your relationships in your own home. And he really cares about it. It's never too late, fathers, mothers, children, to plant a flag in the ground and make a change. It is never too late. Even if you've done everything backwards your whole life from what I've said, even if your kids are already grown out of the house and you're just sitting here in shame, it is never too late to follow the scriptures and to trust the plan that God has placed for you. That's what grace is. Amen. To look back and say, hey, I may have failed. I did fail. I can point to all these areas of my life where I didn't get it right, but guess what? I can get it right going forward because His grace is sufficient for me to do that. Amen. Don't just say it's not worth it. I've, I've already failed. It's not worth it. Who said God never? Where is that in the Bible? I already failed. It's not worth it. Where is that? That's not anywhere in the Bible. If you confess your sins, He's faithful to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Even if you can't even look at your wife right now, even if wife you can't even look at your husband right now, you need to know that His grace is sufficient to bring you through and to reorder your family. He can, by his power, reorder your family. Listen, the God that made Red Sea stand up on the side and bring a million people through the middle can fix your family. Okay? I promise you. You may think I can't or it's too late. It is not. It is not. There is nothing impossible with God. Nothing. So, I hope that you live the new life in your mind. I hope that you live the new life in this church and your relationships with one another. And today, I'm challenging you. Are you living the new life in your home, in your family, in your relationships? Privilege.